Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We are going to talk about acute uh, renal failure today, which is in the newer terminology also considered as acute uh, kidney injury. We are going to cover the topic in terms of a uh, overview, definition, and classification, the epidemiology of acute renal failure, the causes and the etiology, the pathophysiology of the uh, syndrome, and a basic approach to its prevention and management. So, um, as you know, the Kidneys are basically involved in cleaning the waste products generated in the body. So, uh, uh, in simplistic terms, what happens is that the blood enters the kidney from the systemic circulation to the renal artery, where it gets filtered in multiple units or nephrons, uh, where there are the glomerular filtration barriers and uh, the unnecessary waste products and controlled amounts of water as and when needed and electrolytes are excreted in the form of urine which is passed through the ureters to the urinary bladder while the essential components all the blood components and proteins nutrients uh, the water required and some ions are returned to the systemic circulation via the renal vein so basically the kidneys clean the toxic waste products <clears throat> and also maintain the fluid electrolyte balance in the body so, uh, when we define acute renal failure or acute kidney injury, it is basically a clinical condition which is characterized by a rapid decrease in this excretory function of the kidneys. And when we say rapid, we consider it in terms of hours or days. That is what is acute. So, uh, when, we, when the body is uh, unable to get rid of its waste products because the kidneys are not working, it leads to accumulation of products of nitrogen metabolism like urea and creatinine and other waste products in the body which leading to a rise in the blood levels of these products. So, uh, that is what we measure when we measure the blood urea and the serum creatinine which are markers of kidney function. Now, acute kidney injury or acute renal failure could occur in many settings. It could occur in a completely normal person. It could occur in a person who already has some chronic or permanent damage in kidneys in which case it is referred to as an acute or chronic kidney disease or acute deterioration of the kidney function. Now, uh, this was the simplistic term of a definition of acute kidney injury or acute renal failure in all these years. But over the last uh, few years, there has been a change in the understanding and definitions used for defining this problem. So, why was a newer definition or classification required? Because Normally, the creatinine and the blood urea are used to measure the kidney function, but the GFR is the best index of kidney function. Now, the GFR or the glomerular filtration rate, as you know, is the volume of plasma which is filtered by the kidneys in unit time. Now, actually measuring the GFR is cumbersome and not practical in bedside practice. So, uh, what is routinely done is we uh, measure the levels of endogenous filtration markers like serum creatinine. And we calculate the GFR from using the serum creatinine and other parameters like age, gender and race, which is known as the estimated GFR. So, various formulas like the MDRD formula and the cockroft call formula are routinely used for measuring the GFR based on the serum creatinine. And uh, as we know, serum creatinine is not very sensitive in detecting an early decline in GFR. So, initially when the GFR declines, the creatinine may continue to remain normal. And by the time the creatinine actually starts rising, the GFR decline may be already significant and the patient may already have had significant acute kidney injury, which may not be picked up if you just measure the serum creatinine. Second thing was, uh, traditionally the urine output was used to define acute renal failure, uh, whether there was a decrease in urine output or not. But sometimes whenever there is decline in GFR, the urine output may not decrease what is known as a non-oliguric acute renal failure. So, we should understand the early definition, the routine definition that a deterioration in few minutes or hours or days of the renal function does not adequately capture the entire spectrum of the disease. 
So as I told you earlier, the Cockcroft Gall formula or the MDRD formula is used to calculate the estimated GFR based on the serum creatinine. So that is why uh, the need for a newer definition of acute renal failure was warranted. And we need to understand the concept when you say failure is a quite advanced disease, but acute injury to the kidneys is a wider spectrum. It starts from a normal kidney, which is at an increased risk of damage, acute damage because of many factors, which we'll discuss subsequently. If this risk factors are not removed in adequate, in, in a timely fashion, then it can actually damage the kidney. Progressive damage may lead to a decline in the GFR and finally we come to the stage of kidney failure leading to which may lead to death. So the spectrum of acute kidney injury begins from the time it is at an increased risk and progresses to failure. So if you just say acute renal failure you would be targeting only the advanced stage of the disease and you would be missing the early stage when interventions may be successful and improve the, may improve the outcome. And that is why the term of acute kidney injury is gradually replacing the term acute renal failure. So based on this, uh, uh, many classification have come over the last decade to better define and quantify acute renal failure. The rifle criteria came in 2004, followed by the acute kidney injury network classification in 2007 and finally the KDGO classification in 2012. So, the rifle criteria defined acute renal failure or acute kidney injury in the terms of risk, injury, failure, loss and finally end stage kidney disease. Each stage was defined based on the creatinine and the urine output. So, risk would be a 1.5 times increase in creatinine or a decrease in urine output 0.5 ml per kg per hour for at least 6 hours. Its injury would be doubling of serum creatinine or persistent decrease in urine output for 12 hours. Failure would be a three times increase in creatinine or an absolute increase of at least 4 milligram per deciliter or a pro more prolonged decrease in urine output or even anuria for 12 hours. And finally, loss would be a persistent failure for com or complete loss of renal function for at least four weeks. So, now we understand the rifle said that there was a doubling or 1.5 times increase in serum creatinine, but in what duration? So the acute kidney injury network gave a better definition in terms of time. They said an abrupt increase within 48 hours, an abrupt decline within 48 hours of the kidney function, which would be defined as an absolute increase in serum creatinine of at least 0.3 milligram per deciliter or a 50% increase in serum creatinine or a decrease in urine output for more than 6 hours. So they added a time context to the definition. And finally, the KDGO defined it in terms of time a little better. They said that an increase in serum creatinine by at least 0.3 within 48 hours or 1.5 times the baseline which is known or presumed to have occurred within the prior 7 days. This is important because many times a patient may come to the emergency with a rise in serum creatinine but we may not have a baseline, so we would not know what the rise was. In which case, based on other clinical factors, we can presume that, yes, this could be the baseline creatinine of the patient and the creatinine has increased now. So, the KDGO definition is uh, more clinically relevant and more clinically applicable on the bedside in the patient. So, KDGO gave the stages of kidney injury as 1, 2 and 3 based on the type of, type of rise in creatinine and the urine output. So, stage 1 was the initial stage followed by stage 3 which was the most severe stage wherein there was a 3 times rise in serum creatinine or the need for initiation of dialysis with or, or without an increase in urine output, decrease in urine output or persistent anuria. Now, having looked at the classification, let us look at the epidemiology of acute renal failure. So, the incidence of acute renal failure or acute kidney injury uh, varies based on the definition the population we are looking at and the severity of the disease we are considering. So, broadly acute renal failure based epidemiologically is classified as a community acquired or community based or and hospital acquired or hospital based. Now, community acquired acute kidney injury or acute renal failure patients are patients who are admitted into the hospital with an acute renal injury. So, they acquire, they develop the disease, the renal insult and then they come to the hospital. This is uncommon in developed countries. Um, 
because probably because of better infection control measures and it is more common in developing countries like India. Uh, hospitalized patients often develop acute kidney injury because of a variety of causes which we will discuss. The incidence again ranges from 1 to 9 percent and is higher in developed countries. Uh, acute kidney injury is very common, especially hospital acquired acute kidney injury in critically ill patients in the ICU. Uh, most patients in ICU uh, develop some sort of renal insult at some point of time and uh, the incidence ranges from 40 to 60 percent. It is especially common when the patients have sepsis and the unfortunate part is uh, critically ill patients when they develop uh, acute renal failure, they have a very high incidence of mortality up to 40 to 60 percent. Uh, again, the pattern of acute renal failure, the causes of acute renal failure also vary ac across geographical settings. So, if you come go to develop, look at developing countries like India, African country nations uh, where diarrheal illnesses are very common, uh, acute renal failure secondary to hypovolemia and dehydration because of diarrhea and vomiting is very common whereas you won't see it very frequently in developed countries. Again, infections like malaria, leptospirosis. Uh, causes like snake bites leading to acute renal failure are exclusively, almost exclusively seen in tropical countries and subtropical countries and developing nations. On the other hand, um, hospital acquired kidney injury because of a cardiac surgery is more common in developed countries and tertiary hospitals where these facilities are available. Etiology of acute kidney injury also varies with age. Newborns may have some different completely different uh, pattern of causes of acute renal failure while uh, the disease causes again etiology is again uh, varies in elderly patients. So uh, let us look at the etiology how acute causes of acute renal failure are classified. So broadly when we define a cause of acute renal failure we define it according to the location of the insult. So uh, there could be a cause which is decreasing the renal perfusion. So the blood supply, the actual blood supply to the kidneys is not adequate due to a variety of causes which is one of the most common causes of acute renal failure and this is defined as a pre-renal acute renal failure. There could be an actual uh, damage to the various component tissues of the kidney itself in which case it would be defined as an intrinsic or parenchymatous uh, cause of kidney failure and then uh, the kidneys may be producing ur enough urine but there is a problem with the outflow of urine there is some blockage at some level in the outflow that is known as a post renal or obstructive cause of acute renal failure. Now the pre renal acute renal failure accounts for 40 to 80 percent of the cases seen. Uh, it common causes are there could be a defect decrease in the effective extracellular volume and um, because of a renal loss like uh, there is an intrinsic uh, decrease in the renal blood supply which could be because of blood loss, vomiting, diarrhea burns or sometimes in the hospital because of excessive use of diuretics in patients, especially in patients in, with cardiac disease. Uh, there could may not be actual loss of fluid or blood volume, but there could be a redistribution or third space redistribution as we see in chronic liver disease, in nephrotic syndrome because of low serum albumin levels, intestinal obstruction patients, pancreatitis and peritonitis. Sometimes uh, there is an actual decrease in cardiac output which reduces the renal perfusion like any cardiac disease like cardiogenic shock or myocarditis or myocardial infarction or congestive heart failure. Sometimes the blood volume is adequate but there is peripheral vasodilatation leading to pooling of blood in the peripheral circulation reducing the renal perfusion. Most common cause is sepsis, uh, hypotension due to any other cause, anaphylactic shock. Uh, sometimes there could be renal vasoconstriction because of causes like hypercalcemia or hepatorenal syndrome or prostaglandin synthesis inhibition. Sometimes it is drug induced if efferent arterial or vasodilatation because of which less blood actually reaches the renal glomeruli which is a common cause is the use of angiotensin convertase enzyme inhibitors which, are common drug, which is a common drug used in medicine. Next we come to intrinsic acute renal failure where there is actual injury to the kidney tissue which is seen in 10 to 30 percent cases of acute renal failure. Uh, the commonest among them is acute tubular injury where the renal tubules are injured and uh, we have to understand that any cause, any pre-renal cause which is decreasing the blood supply to the kidneys 
if it intervent if not intervened at a proper time if it is prolonged it causes tubular injury so all the causes which cause prerenal acute renal failure can actually cause acute tubular injury as well it is a continuous spectrum if not intervened at the appropriate time and this is known as ischemic acute tubular injury because of a prolonged lack of blood supply or renal perfusion what else can cause acute tubular injury uh, many toxic factors which is known as nephrotoxic acute tubular injury uh, it could be uh, many some antibiotics so drug induced acute renal failure most of the causes are lead to acute tubular injury uh, radio contrast agents which are commonly used for ct scan coronary angiographies Uh, immunosuppressive drugs like cyclosporin uh, some alternative medicines like um, chinese herbs have are known to cause heavy metals especially mercury is known to cause uh, acute uh, tubular injury snake venoms radiation injury uh, certain uh, molecules so sometimes some situations uh, disease conditions which produce excessive proteins like multiple myeloma very high calcium levels a uh, very high oxalate level seen in primary oxalosis all these things can get deposited in the kidney tubules and lead to tubular injury uh, certain situations like um, rhabdomyolysis when you have crush injuries and leading to release of myoglobin from the uh, mus skeletal muscles the myoglobin gets deposited in the renal tubules and this can lead to tubular injuries hyperthermia toxins like ethylene glycol carbon monoxide hemoglobinuria so in just like myoglobinuria because of crush injury any cause which causes hemo inter uh, intravascular hemolysis like ma malaria or uh, transfusion reactions can lead to hemoglobin free hemoglobin associated renal tubular injury now uh, intrinsic acute kidney injury can also occur when the glomerular uh, tissue is damaged though less common it can occur in any of the glomerular diseases acute nephritic syndromes like post infectious glomerular nephritis henoch schonlein purpura lupus ig nephropathy uh, the glomerular basement anti gbm disease or the vasculitis associated glomerular diseases sometimes the blood vessel the smaller blood vessels of the or the larger blood vessels may be affected uh when the large vessels are affected like renal artery thrombosis or uh, bilateral renal vein thrombosis this can lead to acute kidney injury small vessels may be involved in situations like thrombotic microangiopathy leading to due to hemolytic syndrome or uremic syndrome or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura antiphospholipid syndrome some rarely dic or even vasculitis can involve the small vessels in the kidney and lead to acute kidney injury uh sometimes the glomeruli the tubules the vessels are spared but only the interstitium is affected which is uh, known as acute interstitial nephritis though uh, most cases of acute interstitial nephritis usually lead to a non oliguric kind of acute renal failure very common causes of acute interstitial nephritis are antibiotics uh, especially penicillin and penicillin sulfonamides painkillers and sedatives again very easily available over the counter drugs which commonly cause acute interstitial nephritis and there are a host of other drugs sometimes some autoimmune diseases like sle and uh, can may also present as acute interstitial nephritis and rarely it may be idiopathic and lastly post renal acute renal failure which is less common seen in 5 to 15% cases it is um, as i referred to urine is produced but it cannot be passed because of a blockage somewhere in the output path and uh, there are multiple causes the causes vary according to age in the children it could be because of a posterior urethral valve or a neurogenic bladder in the elderly it could be because of a prostatic enlargement in diabetics it could be because of a papillary necrosis there are a host of malignancies which can cause bilateral uretric involvement uh, because of metastases like uh, prostatic cancer cervical cancer in females colonic malignancies rarely other uncommon causes are retroperitoneal fibrosis due to any cause uh, traumatic uh, uh, post renal aki acute uric acid nephropathy which is less common and some rare infections having looked at the various causes uh, depending upon the level of involvement let's look at the pathophysiology so as we saw earlier ischemia due to decreased renal perfusion is the most common cause of acute renal failure 
What ischemia does is it leads to the endothelial injury which causes activation of vasoconstrictors, impaired vasodilatation and increased leukocyte adhesion. This leads to capillary obstruction and which leads to accentuation and perpetuation of the ischemia which further leads to an endoth further endothelial injury. So, it is like a vicious cycle. Now, these activation of leukocyte adhesion factors leads to inflammation which again causes endothelial injury. Now, the ischemia also causes tubular injury, uh, which is the acute tubular injury. This leads to disruption of cytoskeleton, loss of cell polarity, leading to apoptosis and necrosis, desquamation of cells, tubular obstruction, and back leak. So, both inflammation and ischemic injury are at play when the patient has a prerenal or uh, ischemic acute, tubular, acute kidney injury. So, as I said earlier, any cause which causes prerenal ARF or prerenal AKI can also, if prolonged for a sufficient period of time, lead to acute tubular injury and even acute tubular necrosis. So, you have a patient who has high risk of ischemic acute tubular injury. And if initially there is prerenal AKI when the patient may respond to correction of volume, but if it this is not addressed at the appropriate time, the tubular injury and tubular necrosis sets in and at this period the patient is has volume unresponsive acute kidney injury. So, it is a continuous spectrum, it all depends on at what stage you diagnose the patient and whether you have intervened or not. Now, when we look at a very another very common cause of uh, ARF which especially we see in the hospital setting is sepsis. Now, uh, sepsis leads there is gram negative bacteremia which leads to lipopolysaccharide release, cytokines are released which causes release of nitric oxide synthetase. Increased nitric oxide levels lead to systemic vasodilatation and pooling of blood and as I said earlier because of this the actual effective blood supply to the kidney decreases leading to acute renal failure. The increase in nitric oxide also leads promotes the formation of glomerular microthrombi. So, there may be glomerular damage as well and Gram negative bacteriumia leads to oxygen radical, free oxygen radical uh, release. So, there are re reactive oxygen species are released, which also causes direct tubular damage and tubular injury to the kidneys. So, basically, you have three factors you have ischemic insults, you may have a systemic inflammation, and you have a sepsis induced direct toxic injury. And so, initially any cause of acute kidney injury that starts with a sublethal injury when it is cell regeneration is possible and if the patient does not recover from this phase, it progresses to apoptosis and cell necrosis. So, having understood the common causes and how they lead to acute uh, renal injury and acute renal insults, we look at a basic approach to prevention and management. Now, when we, talk, when we talk of prevention and management of acute renal failure, it starts with assessment of patient and risk stratification and diagnosis. So, even before the patient dev actually develops acute renal failure, you start the management of acute renal failure by looking for risk factors. And then you go ahead and remove those risk factors if possible or treat the causes, give supportive treatment and if nothing else works, the patient needs dialysis. So, when we look for, when we look at risk stratification for acute renal failure, we need to understand that there are certain exposures which can cause acute renal failure like sepsis, critical illness, circulatory shock due to um, actual or effective loss of blood volume like burns, trauma, cardiac surgery, any other major surgery, use of nephrotoxic drugs, use of contrast agents in radiology or any animal or plant toxins. So, all these exposures can cause acute renal failure, but not all patients who have these exposures actually develop acute renal failure. So, there are certain factors which make a patient susceptible to acute renal failure like a dehydrated patient, dehydration of volume depletions. So if a dehydrated patient is given a contrast agent during a CT scan, he is at a higher risk of developing an acute renal failure compared to a patient who is well hydrated. Similarly, advanced age, elderly patients, females, a black race, a patient who already has some underlying chronic kidney disease. So, as I said in my initial slides, an acute kidney injury can develop in a patient superimposed on a chronic kidney disease. 
any other chronic disease involving any other major system. So, a patient who has heart disease or a chronic liver disease, if he is given a nephrotic, nephrotoxic antibiotic or a painkiller, he is more susceptible. Diabetes. Now, diabetes is the commonest cause of chronic kidney disease. So, a diabetic patient is also at an increased risk of an acute insult. Malignancies and even patients treat, treated for malignancies with chemotherapy or radiation therapy, anemic patients. So, if, you if a patient has any of these susceptibilities, he has a higher risk of developing acute renal failure with these exposures. So, when a patient is seen in an emergency or on a renal consult to any other service, every patient should have a blood urea and serum creatinine checked at the baseline routinely. Uh, the patient should be evaluated clinically for the exposure factors as well as the susceptibility factors. And based on the exposure, the patient is stratified as low risk, medium risk and high risk. And based on this, in the risk stratification, the, the patient should undergo serum creatinine testing and urine output monitoring at regular intervals for early detection of acute renal failure. Now, the frequency and duration of monitoring will change depending upon the degree of risk the patient is exposed to. And if a patient is at a high risk, then the syrup creatinine should be measured daily initially. And um, all, all these critically ill patients should have a urine output monitoring. Now, when we talk of diagnosis of acute renal failure, that is simple. Uh, you do a serum creatinine, you calculate an estimated GFR and you monitor the urine output to stage the and uh, the severity of acute kidney injury based upon the classification whether it is stage 1 stage 2 or stage 3 and then you do a detailed assessment for the cause of acute renal failure and subsequent management will depend on the cause and the severity of the disease now when we are evaluating a uh, patient for acute renal failure we know based on the serum creatinine and the estimated gfr and the urine output that the patient has acute renal failure now why did the acute renal failure develop we need a careful history and detailed physical examination. Why is this important? Because uh, the past medical history tells us about the risk factor or the susceptibility. If a patient, like a patient may give a history of a chronic liver disease or a past cardiac disease. So, if a patient of coronary artery disease has an episode of diarrhea, he is at a higher risk. So, if a patient of elderly patient which comes with diarrhea and the decreased urine output, we need to know whether he has a past history of diabetes or he has a past history of cardiac disease or any recent surgery, drug history. This is very important. This is something which is often missed. A patient may come with a rise in creatinine and we are worried about the rise in creatinine. We are doing fancy investigations. But uh, we often may miss in the history that the patient has taken over-the-counter drug. Maybe the patient had some pay headache or pain in the body and just took a painkiller. He took a ibuprofen or a diclofenac, over-the-counter drug went to the pharmacy and got it directly and um, a pain sometimes in susceptible patients even a single dose of NSAID can cause acute renal failure severe acute renal failure but we need to know whether the patient is using recreational drugs or any alternative medicines uh, the social history is important because um, if a patient has traveled to a uh, to an area which is endemic for malaria or um, if a patient works a work like a patient is a farm worker and has exposure to rodents which increases risk for leptospirosis this is important if you're seeing a patient who is already hospitalized and then has been referred to you for a rise in serum creatinine or a decline in urine output which is suspected to be due to an acute renal failure then a detailed chart review of the drug medications the patient has received or the procedures that the patient has undergone in the hospital is important because Maybe the patient has undergone a CT scan for investigation for fever and um, has received a contrast agent or the patient has received certain antibiotics which are known to be nephrotoxic and uh, then we need to know, look no further. Uh, sometimes the symptoms of the patient presents may suggest the cause like if a patient has fever, has joint pains, has rash, this could suggest an autoimmune disease like lupus, which could have a multisystemic involvement, including the kidneys, and may present with acute renal failure. Sometimes patients with idiopathic acute interstitial nephritis may come with a fever and a rash. Uh, if a patient has a breathlessness and a palpitation, along with a decline in urine output, it could be suggestive of a cardiorenal syndrome. Of course, the patient could give a history of diarrhea or vomiting. A preceding bloody diarrhea, especially in children, could suggest a hemolytic uremic syndrome. Uh, 
uh, there could be a preceding history of pharyngitis, sore throat, which could suggest uh, post infectious glomerular disease. Uh, now, once we have looked at the causes uh, and the diagnosis of acute renal failure, we should also remember that um, the patient's urine output could also be not just suggestive of the severity of acute renal failure, also of the cause, because generally uh, the patient with acute renal failure will be oliguric some, and slowly progressive decline in urine output, but sometimes the patient may be abrupt, may have abrupt anuria or complete absence of urine output less than 100 ml per day which could be very commonly due to acute bilateral obstruction, obstructive uropathy or because of a sudden vascular catastrophe like a bilateral renal vein thrombosis or a renal artery thrombosis. If there is a slowly decline in urine output with frequency and urgency, it could suggest a urinary tract infection, a prostatic enlargement or a urethral stricture. If there is blood in urine, um, like there is a painless hematuria, it could be suggestive of glomerular disease leading to acute renal failure or if it is painful, it could suggest an obstructive disease like a malignancy. The clinical evaluation is important. It could tell us about the hydration status. Um, sometimes dehydration can cause to uh, can lead to acute renal failure. We need to look for signs of acute and chronic heart failure, infections, um, other signs of systemic disease like skin rash or seen in vasculitis or autoimmune disease, uh, signs of atheroembolic disease. Now, when we look, when we are talking assessment of urine output, um, based on it, the renal failure is defined as either oliguric, non-oliguric, or aneuric. So, oliguric renal failure is a functionally uh, urine output which is less than that which is required to clean, clear all the solutes that need to be excreted. So, urine output less than 400 ml per day uh, in adults is oliguric ARF. While an urine output less than 100 ml per day is aneuric ARF and as I said earlier, aneuric ARF um, is less common. Now, non-oliguric versus oliguric is an important case because uh, non-oliguric ARFs fare better. They have a better outcome while the mortality rate may be as high as 80% in oliguric ARF, especially in a uh, critical care setting. Now, what other investigations do you need? So, diagnosis of ARF is simple, uh, urine output, the serum creatinine and the blood urea nitrogen. Uh, based on that, you calculate the estimated GFR. But you need to look at certain other things. You need to look at the electrolytes, the sodium, potassium, because you can have hyperkalemia, which may be life-threatening. If the patient has uh, severe diarrhea, vomiting, as, but is non-oliguric, you can have hypokalemia. You can have electrolyte imbalance, uh, hyponatremia, especially in elderly patients. Blood gas anomalies, uh, blood gas estimate analysis is important to look for metabolic acidosis. A blood count and differential to look for infection. Always check the urine if the patient is passing urine. Why is this important? Because uh, the urine often, urinary indices are uh, often a simple way to differentiate between pre-renal AKI and acute tubular necrosis or acute tubular injury. If there's protein in urine, it could be suggestive of glomerular disease or a pre-existing chronic kidney disease. Urinary sediment is important. You may have eosinophils in urine because of an acute interstitial nephritis. WBCs could be suggestive again of an AIN or a urinary tract infection, which could be subsequently defined by urinary culture. You could have RBCs and RBC casts in acute glomerular diseases. Sometimes you may have crystals like anoxylosis, which could also be diagnostic. Now, what are the urinary indices which have been uh, commonly traditionally used in for bedside differentiation between acute tubular necrosis and a pre-renal ARF? Uh, so, when you have a pre-renal ARF, you have a decrease in renal perfusion, but your renal tubules are still intact. So, they try to reabsorb as much as sodium and water they can to maintain the body fluid balance. So, what happens is in a pre-renal uh, ARF, the urinary sodium is low, it is less than 20. Whereas in acute tubular injury, the tubules are damaged, they cannot reabsorb the sodium. So, in that case, the urinary sodium is high more than 40. And this is best defined by the fractional excretion of sodium, which is um, urinary sodium into plasma creatinine upon plasma sodium into urinary creatinine uh, into 100. And the phena is typically less than 1% in a pre-renal ARF patient, which progresses to more than 4% once acute tubular injury sets in. Of course, uh, there are exceptions to this. 
in patients with acute tubular injury in the early stages or those who have sodium avid states like congestive heart failure or cirrhosis, the FENA may still be less than 1% despite the kidneys being already showing tubular necrosis. Uh, again, in a prerenal patient, you may still have uh, FENA more than 1% because the patient is on diuretics. So, obviously, there will be increased sodium loss in the urine. The other thing to remember is uh, pre-renal patients usually have a high blood urea compared to the, the serum creatinine. Uh, the ratio is more than 20. So, the blood urea creatinine ratio is more than 20 is to 1. It would suggest a pre-renal cause. But again, this comes with caveats. Uh, it could be elevated because of increased urea production or absor reabsorption as you see in um, GI bleeds, steroid use or certain antibiotics like digicycline. What is the role of radiology? Uh, every patient with an acute urinal failure should have an ultrasound examination of the kidney, ureter and bladder. Why? Uh, one thing is if you have, uh, if the ultrasound shows small shrunken kidneys, you know that the patient has chronic kidney damage. So, this acute kidney injury could be a superimposed insult or it could just be a chronic kidney disease patient who has come with its routine rise in creatinine. So, this way it's very important. Other thing is it shows the presence of obstruction. So, if the patient has hydronephrosis on an ultrasound, then that suggests that the patient has an obstruction somewhere like below the, beyond the kidneys. It could show other causes like stones or the presence of infective foci or malignancies. Uh, now, it is not always so simple to differentiate between acute or chronic renal failure, especially in the Indian setting, patients do not get routine blood tests and so we may not have a baseline creatinine in all these patients. So, just lab values will not always differentiate, but there can be some clues. As I said earlier, the ultrasound may show shrunken kidneys in chronic kidney disease. Other than that, uh, a patient, if he has a pre-existing illness like diabetes or hypertension, which are common causes of chronic kidney disease or is an advanced age, that puts him at a higher risk. If a patient gives long-standing uremic symptoms like weakness, fatigue, difficulty in walking or climbing stairs, a loss of appetite, nausea, or pruritus. This would suggest that the patient has a pre-existing chronic kidney disease. Uh, we would investigate, uh, do other investigations for etiology as we discussed earlier. So, if a patient has a crush injury and comes with a decline in urine output, then obviously you will do a chronic uh, creatinine phosphokinase and free myoglobin in urine to identify rhabdomyolysis. You would do an infection disease workup if um, the counts and the clinical symptoms are suggestive of an infection. If you think of vasculitis or glomerulonephritis, you would do a autoimmune marker, disease marker workup. If you're suspecting a thrombotic microangiopathy due to HUS, you would do a peripheral smear for LDH, the platelets, the liver function tests. Elderly patients, hypercalcemia with the albumin globulin ratio reversal, you would think about doing a myeloma screen. Coming to biomarkers for acute renal failure, um, this is still experimental, um, though it is gaining popularity. It, why is it gaining popularity? Because uh, it can actually pick up uh, certain markers like NGAL or KIM-1 can actually pick up a kidney injury even before the creatinine starts rising or the urine output starts decreasing or the GFR starts declining. And so, you can intervene earlier. Uh, for example, you have a patient with cardiac surgery. He's on some antibiotic which is known to cause acute kidney injury. His creatinine is normal. His estimated GFR is normal. But if his urinary and gal starts elevating, that means he is, his creatinine is going to rise at some point of time. So, it would be prudent to stop the antibiotic at that phase and change it to some safer antibiotic. And in that way, we could actually prevent uh, severe acute renal failure and its attendant complications. So, uh, biomarkers, um, there's a lot of research going on, but as such, still not being used in routine bedside practice. Kidney biopsy is not usually done. Uh, when do we do a kidney biopsy in acute renal failure? You need to rule out, be sure there is no post renal cause, obstructive cause of acute renal failure. There is no correctable pre renal cause. Clinical findings are not typical of acute tubular injury because, as such, for acute tubular injury, you do not need to do a kidney biopsy. It's a clinical diagnosis. But yes, if a patient has heavy proteinuria, if a patient has urinary sediments or extra renal manifestations that would suggest a systemic disease, 
the clinical and lab picture does not fit in, then it is better to go for a kidney biopsy to uh, be sure what is going on, especially to rule out glomerular diseases. Now, coming to management of acute renal failure, um, once you've diagnosed the cause and graded the severity, we have to understand that it is a heterogeneous disease. Many times, there may be multiple triggers. You could be an elderly patient, you are diabetic, you come with diarrhea and vomiting, which can cause acute renal failure. And then you are given antibiotics. Maybe you have taken a painkiller. So you have multiple factors. Uh, we need to address the most common factor, the prenatal or improving, restoring the renal perfusion and uh, withdrawal of offending agent if there is a nephrotoxic insult. Of course, there are specific management depending on etiology like treating with antibiotics for infection or optimizing the cardiac status or using immunosuppression drugs for vasculitis or autoimmune diseases, using plasmapheresis for thrombotic microangiopathy or simply relieving the obstruction if there is an obstructive uropathy. Now, when we talk of correcting the renal perfusion, hemodynamic resuscitation is very important. Uh, the kidneys have an autoregulatory system which can maintain the renal perfusion despite changes in blood pressure as long as the mean arterial pressure is maintained at 65 millimeters of mercury. But once it drops below that, then the renal perfusion suffers. So our goal should be to keep a mean arterial pressure of 65. Correction of uh, volume deficit is important to minimize the further extension of the kidney injury facilitate the recovery from the renal insult and minimize residual impairment. But you have to be careful, especially in patients who are oliguric because giving excessive fluids uh, in a patient who is oliguric may lead to volume overload and uh, which is, can cause pulmonary edema which leads to increased mortality. So how do you resuscitate? Fluid resuscitation should mainly use isotonic crystalloids, mainly normal saline in adults rather than colloids like albumin or starches uh, because there is a lack of clear evidence that colloids are superior to normal saline for this purpose and certain colloids like HES may actually cause osmotic nephrosis and lead to worsening of the renal disease. High molecular starches can also cause coagulation defects and they are expensive. So, as such, normal saline should suffice. If the patient is not responsive to normal saline, uh, resuscitation may often require vasopressors. Uh, persistent hypotension despite optimization of intravascular volume. Um, vasopressors should be used in conjunction with fluids. The first line of agent used is norepinephrine, especially in patients with sepsis. Vasopressin is used in patients who are refractory to norepinephrine. Dopamine is no longer recommended. That We should keep that in mind in these patients because it is associated with decreased survival and has been shown not to cause renal protection in advanced renal disease. So what is goal-directed management? Goal-directed management of AKI is protocol-based management of hemodynamic and oxygenation parameters to prevent development of or worsening of AKI in high-risk patients, especially in patients who are um, critically ill, perioperative setting, post-operative and sepsis patients. So you monitor invasively and or non-invasively if possible with defined target values and a time limit to reach to re these target goals. So, this is early goal-directed therapy for septic shock. Hypotensive patients with severe infection should be rapidly assessed for tissue perfusion uh, using the mean arterial pressure and the plasma lactate levels. And the resuscitation protocol uh, using normal saline and uh, vasopressors should be initiated with the goal of re-establishing tissue perfusion within 6 hours of diagnosis. This is critical. The 6 hours is critical because it has been shown to associate with improved outcomes. And what should be the goal? Mean arterial pressure should be raised to at least 65 millimeters of mercury. The CVP should be maintained between 8 to 12 uh, centimeters. The blood lactate levels should be corrected. The central venous oxygen saturation should be more than 70%. And the urine output should be restored to more than at least 0.5 ml per kg per hour. Then you should look at nephrotoxic exposures because um, they are common. Ch hospitalized patients, a detailed chart review. And uh, if a patient is already at high risk, then certain antibiotics and um, painkillers should be avoided. 
a uh, special uh, caution should be taken while using radio contrast agents aminoglycosides antifungals like amphotericin non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs beta lactams certain beta lactams acyclovir and chemotherapy angiotensin converters enzyme inhibitors and certain immunosuppressive drugs like cyclosporin and tacrolimus now uh, once we have removed or treated the cause of acute renal failure we look at supportive management uh, so we often as i said earlier critically ill patients are at very high risk of developing acute renal failure and they all often have multisystemic involvement so um, if they are diabetic insulin therapy would be required to maintain the plasma glucose levels optimally anemia needs to correct be corrected as it is a risk factor for acute renal failure the drug dosing should be adjusted according to the renal function the cockroach golf formula should be used to calculate the estimated gfr and the drug dosing should be done accordingly also if a patient is oliguric and or anuric then he should receive much lower doses of certain drugs uh, which are meant for end stage kidney disease patients stress ulcer prophylaxis is advisable and infection control and infection prevention is important uh in early days people used to routinely use diuretics for uh, converting an oliguric acute renal failure to non oliguric acute renal failure because if the urine output improved then you could give more fluids and could manage volume overload but it should not be used routinely uh, because it may be ineffective and it can actually lead to worsening of the aki by causing increased volume depletion and as i said earlier low dose dopamine should not be used anymore protein caloric malnutrition should be um, addressed because acute kidney injury is a hypercatabolic state so you need to give adequate nutrition if a patient is enteral route is always preferred the total intake of calorie should be at least 20 to 30 kilocalories per kg per day and the protein intake should be good it should be 0.8 to 1 gram per kg per day in non catabolic patients who do not need dialysis while hypercatabolic patients or patients who need dialysis will need 1 to 1.5 gram per kg per day of proteins and finally if nothing works of course you need dialysis uh so the conventional criteria for dialysis in acute renal failure patients any patient who has anuria persistent anuria for 6 to 12 hours or prolonged oliguria for 12 hours hyperkalemia becomes an emergency severe metabolic acidosis again an emergency volume overload especially pulmonary edema if the patient has not responded to diuretics you need to dialyze the patient and remove fluid very high urea or creatinine levels and clinical complications rarely like pericarditis or encephalopathy when should dialysis be initiated that is not well defined um, again as i discussed the emergency causes would obviously um, make it an urgent need but uh, other situations need to be considered other clinical indications conditions situations need to be considered the dialysis modalities could be the routine intermittent hemodialysis used or it could be a sustained low efficiency dialysis a continuous renal replacement therapy peritoneal dialysis is not routinely used for acute renal failure because there are limitations in the clearance solute clearance and fluid removal but in countries like uh, india or uh, where sometimes in peripheral areas hemodialysis is not available peritoneal dialysis may be life saving none of these dialysis modalities have shown any survival advantage but yes a continuous renal replacement therapy or sustained low efficiency dialysis is more useful in hemodynamically unstable patients uh so they can be used in patients who are hypotensive which is often the case in critically ill patients how does dialysis help other than correcting hyperkalemia or removing solute and fluid and correcting acidosis it helps in volume control because fluid overload can cause pulmonary edema also if volume is adequately removed then it allows um the intensivist to provide nutrition i and antibiotics required to be given in uh, fluid sometimes so uh, it allows more liberalized fluid intake in a critically ill patient if adequate fluid is removed and it allows for drug delivery as i said earlier it allows for correction of dyselectrolytemias and acid base abnormalities and in solute modulation finally um, 
a patient may or may not recover for acute renal failure 30 percent of patients may have persistent renal impairment which may range from require continuing to require dialysis lifelong to a partial recovery of kidney function so every patient of acute kidney injury uh, whether or not he continues to be dialysis dependent or not should be monitored every uh, at least within three months to look for resolution of acute renal failure new onset worsening or worsening of a pre-existing chronic kidney disease if a patient continues to have a residual imp impairment that means he has developed ckd or chronic kidney disease and he has to be managed accordingly and we have to understand that even if a patient of acute renal failure recovers renal function completely he will or he, that patient becomes susceptible to an increased risk of developing chronic disease kidney disease in the future to a recurrence of acute renal failure in the future and he is also a high risk case for cardiovascular disease so to summarize um, arf is common specialized in especially in hospitalized patients uh, every patient may have a multifactorial acute renal failure so looking for multiple factors a thorough investigation clinical evaluation is important it uh, imposes a heavy burden of illness because patients may require dialysis which is expensive there is an increased morbidity and increased mortality risk cost of management is high but we have to understand that it is amenable to early detection and potential prevention. So every patient who comes to the emergency or is hospitalized needs to be screened for risk factors. If hemodynamic resuscitation is started up in an appropriate time and an appropriate manner and nephrotoxics are avoided, then we can reduce the ARF burden and uh, further research is needed to develop biomarkers for early diagnosis and prognostication of acute renal failure.